So I am going to just spend a couple minutes on um, kind of the harmful algal bloom 101. Um, we know that harmful algal blooms, or um, as we often refer to them as HABs, occur around the world, and certainly we have them in Florida. And they're caused by many different species, the majority of which are phytoplankton, so free-floating, um, mostly single-celled organisms. And algal species multiply and bloom when environmental conditions are optimal for cell growth. Now, not all algal blooms are harmful though. So, um, only when um, they cause harm to humans or ecosystems and negatively affect economies would we consider them to be a harmful algal bloom. Next slide, please. So there are some general commonalities that in bloom requirements. Um, for instance, all blooms require sunlight because they're photosynthesizers. Um, they need that sunlight to photosynthesize and grow. Um, that's often correlated with uh, increases in temperature, but um, not always. And then all blooms need nutrients. And these are um, typically in the form of nitrogen and phosphorus, and they can use both external and internal sources. And what I mean by that is internal to the ecosystem and then external, the ones that we are providing from land-based sources. And then um, most blooms or many blooms require time. And often um, this is really um, prominent in freshwater blooms where you have um, blooms occurring in slow moving water. Now I have a circle around the nitrogen and phosphorus and that is because that is the out of these three um, bloom requirements that's the one that humans have the greatest control over. Next slide. And um, because we know that blooms are increasing in both frequency and magnitude um, throughout the world what, and throughout Florida, what Floridians need is access to timely, accurate, and consistent information. Next slide, please. So um, the University of Florida plays a really active role in harmful algal bloom research and extension for the benefit of Floridians, whether that be um, working with resource managers, public health officials, industry, tourism, or residents. And it was a couple years ago that um, the late Carl Havens, who was the director of Florida Sea Grant, realized that there was a lot of expertise um, within UF IFAS who were already working on harmful algal blooms. And he thought we needed a way to bring all of this expertise together to create some synergies and move the science and the outreach and education forward within the state of Florida. And so the UF IFAS HAB task force was established and it continues today under the leadership of um, Dr. Matt Lyles from the Soil and Water Science Department. Next slide. So um, the next couple of slides are just a synthesis of some of the activities that UF IFAS is involved in, in terms of harmful algal bloom research and um, extension. And so this slide focuses on understanding the dynamics and impacts of harmful algal blooms in different systems. And I'm not gonna go through these, these titles, um, they're just, just kind of a way to demonstrate that we're, we're doing many different things um, on a variety of angles in regards to harmful algal blooms. I am not involved in, in this research, but if anyone wants more information about any of these topics, um, they can reach out to me and I can certainly link them with those researchers. Next slide, please. And where UF IFAS really shines is in regards to nutrient management, in regards to harmful algal blooms. And so we're involved in many different programs and research and outreach extension in regards to managing nutrients in the landscape. And this is just a short list. Um, there, I could have gone on and on and on because um, we, we have a very strong focus in this area. Next slide, please. 
And then within Florida Sea Grant, which is the program that I work under, um, we also do a lot in regards to harmful algal blooms. Um, last year, we created a harmful algal bloom work action group, which is where agents and specialists who have an interest in a particular topic get together and work on programs and products of statewide significance. And I co-chair that Harmful Algo Bloom um, Work Action Group and listed are some of the products that we're working on, um, de developing some education products, ASARCA, some composting study, citizen science, such as like the NOAA's um, Phytoplankton Monitoring Network, and then facilitating regional and statewide symposia and workshops. Next slide. And as an example of that last bullet, um, in 2019, we um, put together a State of the Science for Harmful Algal Blooms in Florida symposium, which focused on two um, bloom organisms, Karenia brevis that blooms in the Gulf of Mexico, and Microcystis, a, um, a freshwater organism that blooms in many of our lakes. Um, that symposium brought together 75 uh, researchers from around Florida as well as around the nation. And the result of the um, symposium was a technical document which synthesized the state of the science regarding these two organisms, as well as a prioritized list of research priorities for each bloom organism. And um, we've been working on lay summaries um, for the general public, and those will be available by the end of next week. And both of those, um, the, the technical document right now is available on the Florida Sea Grants um, website, and the lay summaries will also be available there. And then um, I'm working with um, some of my colleagues on developing a macro algal virtual workshop, which will take place in January of 2021. Um, we're also working on a red tide communication plan for the state of Florida, and this is an FWC funded project, as well as a HabScope usability survey. Whoa, I just um, clicked something and lost my, my slides. Hold on. As well as a HabScope usability survey, and um, I'll talk about HabScope in just a second. Next slide, please. So as Philip mentioned, um, I have for the last year um, been Florida Sea Grants HAB liaison to the NOAA's National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science Harmful Algal Bloom Forecasting Branch. And um, the National Centers, um, I'm gonna call them NCAUS from here on out, um, is the lead office in NOAA that works on HAB research monitoring and forecasting and they support the development of HAB forecasts around the country. And my role, um, there, there was many objectives, but one of the main roles was to enhance forecasting by really being the boots on the ground and aligning um, the NCAUS tools with end users and obtaining feedback on some of those forecasting tools so that NCAUS could develop the best tools that were more likely to be used by those end users. And then also developing compelling stories and communication products regarding their HAB products. Next slide, please. So um, here's just kind of a look at some of those products. These are um, satellite images of um, ocean color and um, next to it is the, the true color imagery. And so what NCAUS does is they use um, ocean color to detect harmful algal blooms. So they're looking for a chlorophyll signature in the water. And then based on the chlorophyll signature, they can associate colors with that to um, come up with a scale of intensity. And so if you look at the image on the left, this is Southwest Florida in 2019 during a Karenia brevis bloom. And you can see how you wouldn't be able to look at a true color imagery and see a harmful algal bloom, but you can certainly see it off of Charlotte Harbor and Naples um, where that Karenia brevis bloom is close to shore. And then on the right is the, a corresponding photo for like Okeechobee on the same day and again, um, you see on the true color photo, you don't, 
you really can't see any harmful algal bloom. But in the photo to the right, there's very, very little bloom and it's an indication of how much more sensitive the ocean color imagery is from satellites than our human eye can detect. Next slide. So um, one of the things that the NCAUS group does is they take this, these HAB detections, this, this, um, this information that they get from satellites, and they combine it with water samples for, with, um, with uh, wind speed and direction and other information, and they create models to develop um, products that are targeted towards different user groups. And so in this case, um, every twice, actually twice a week during active blooms, they put to out a, um, a harmful algal bloom bulletin. And this is available to resource managers and health officials. And it's designed to help them ramp up their monitoring and their response to areas where um, blooms are likely to occur. Next slide. And then this um, is one of their newer products. This is a bloom magnitude um, product where they use a, what's called a cyanobacterial index, which is an algorithm to characterize cyanobacteria blooms in lakes. And um, this allows one to determine the bloom magnitude, which is what you see on the left, I lost my titles. And then on the right, they, um, are showing an area normalized bloom magnitude. So that bloom magnitude is normalized to the size of the water body. And um, what they ultimately want to be able to do is allow resource managers to be able to compare um, different years to determine trends over time in individual lakes by using data from the now publicly available Cyan app. Next slide, please. And then this is a product that was developed by NCAUS in partnership with the Gulf of Mexico Coastal Observing, Ocean Observing System, or GCOOS. It's a respiratory forecast for Karenia brevis blooms in the Gulf of Mexico. And Karenia brevis um, produces a toxin called a brevitoxin. And that brevitoxin can become aerosolized or airborne. And when that happens, it can cause respiratory irritation in humans. And that's often in the form of an itchy throat, a cough, scratch, or itchy eyes. But for people who have underlying respiratory illness, such as asthma or COPD, it can cause significant respiratory distress. And also because um, Karenia brevis blooms come on shore in patches, if somebody was at a beach, um, or two people at a beach, let's say Philip and I were at two different beaches, a half mile apart, Philip could be having a wonderful day and I might be coughing and sneezing and having scratchy eyes because I'm affected by the brevitoxins because that patch has come on shore where I am, but not where Philip is. And a lot of that has to do with wind speed and direction, whether the winds are um, onshore or offshore and where that patch came on shore. And so this uses um, a water sample um, that's analyzed through machine learning. And then the resultant cell count is combined with wind speed and direction to create a beach forecast that's updated every three hours. So this is uh, uh, empowering the public to be able to make informed decisions when they go to the beach. Next slide. And then um, I want to circle back to the second bullet, which was developing those compelling stories and communication product about NCAUS HAB products. And for this, um, I worked with the Pi Center, and I'm going to turn it over to Ricky to talk about some of those products that we developed. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. Thank you so much. This is Ricky Telg, and uh, we were in the Pi Center very happy to get uh, Betty's uh, I guess, original phone call earlier this year saying uh, that uh, she needed assistance with the development of these of these HAB products. And so what I'm going to do over the next few minutes is to provide you with an overview of what were developed 
uh, and what is available to you uh, for download or to order. So uh, to begin with, uh, all the materials that we created, uh, again, with collaboration with Florida Sea Grant, uh, was uh, to, to be placed on the Florida Sea Grant website that you see there, uh, flcgrant.org slash H-A-B-S. And so everything that I'll be discussing over the, again, next uh, five to 10 minutes or so are, are available to, to download to you. Uh, but there are also some of the print materials that can be uh, ordered. And that's what I put in the chat box just a second ago. And, and you'll see this uh, same uh, Qualtrics link at the very end of the presentation. Uh, so you, you can either copy it from the, the chat box or um, again, look at it at, it at, the, at the very end. And so that uh, will allow you to order uh, issue guides and rack cards, which I'll describe in just a, a second or so. But uh, you can go there right now to the, the Florida Sea Grant site and uh, to look at all the materials that we're going to be discussing. The first and probably the most important one of all of those is what we call a toolkit. And so that's at the very top of the, the web page. Uh, and what this toolkit is, it's a, it's a, um, a document that compiles all the materials into this very easy to understand guide. And it provides an explanation of each material as I'll discuss it and how to, to use it uh, for educational purposes in, in presentations and in social media. Uh, too. So uh, this provides you a kind of an, an overview of what's inside the toolkit. Uh, it provides information about why this project was uh, initiated in the about page there, an overview of the print materials that can be accessed, including the dimensions. Uh, again, the rack cards and some of the issue guides have it, the issue guide have been printed out too, so you can order those as well. Uh, and then in some detailed instructions about how to include uh, the information in your presentations or in social media. <clears throat> the first print piece is what we call an issue guide. And this is, uh, uh, in this case, this issue is related to uh, informing individuals about how scientists use satellite imaging to locate and track uh, HABs, which uh, Betty has just mentioned in, in her part of the presentation, and how to read a satellite image if they're looking at this uh, on the uh, HABScope uh, 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 webpage. Uh, it also provides uh, information and resources about uh, current uh, HAB uh, forecasts. The rack card is, uh, if you're not familiar with what a rack card is, uh, every time that you go to a hotel or to a tourism location, uh, they have to the side there uh, a place where they have these uh, skinny uh, pieces of paper uh, to highlight some of the local uh, tourism locations. Well, we created one uh, for specifically uh, to provide information on uh, red tide or, or HABs uh, on, on one side and then what to do as well as safety tips on the other. And so uh, kind of a, a Q&A uh, on, on the one page there about how red tides can be harmful to both humans and to wildlife and, and pets, as well as uh, is it safe to eat seafood during that during a, a outbreak and that type of thing. And also, as you see on the, on the right page uh, there on the right hand side of the, the rack card, it's again, uh, a link to the Habscope uh, webpage where they can get up-to-date information on, on, an, on an outbreak. So again, these are available for, for order uh, too. Uh, to me, one of the most exciting parts of this uh, program or presentation that uh, the Pi Center was able to, to produce is social media. Uh, as we know, uh, a lot of people get their information from social media. You know, it can be argued, uh, depending who you talk to, that uh, social media, depending on the, the source of the information about how credible the source is. But what we wanted to do was provide accurate information uh, in a very uh, concise format, graphically pleasing to catch the eye uh, about this very important topic uh, on, on red tide. And so there are five uh, infographics or uh, graphic posts that can be used in social media. And we also provide uh, not only the, the infographics that uh, individuals can use in their own social medias in their counties or in their agencies, but also how to use these social media posts. So it's not just the graphic, but we also include a social media plan about how you might want to use this. And then on the, on the uh, right side of your screen there under where it says post, 
Uh, all you would need to do is to copy and paste that content into your own posts uh, in social media, and uh, you would have something that would be ready to go about, in this case, general information about uh, red tide. In an outbreak, though, as we know, sometimes it's difficult to get all of your information together because things are happening all at the same time in, a, in an emergency, in a crisis situation. So in the event of an outbreak, a red tide event, we've also created a separate social media campaign with these five graphics and also information about how to use those so that all you would need to do is to use the emergency response uh, during this red tide event, uh, including these graphics and again, the, the posts, and they're ready to go. So you don't have to worry about uh, what do I need to say? How can I say this? Uh, it's already there available to you. All you have to do is go there and um, just download the information, uh, download the infographics. Again, all these are on the uh, Florida Sea Grant web, web page, as well as copy and pasting the, the post content into your own posts. For those who like uh, more of a, a personal presentation, we also have two PowerPoint uh, slide sets uh, that include a lot of the information that we've already talked about today during Betty's uh, discussion. Uh, one is on red tide uh, and safety and more about a, a kind of a, a FAQ type of, uh, of an approach. The other one is on uh, satellite imaging and how uh, satellites are used to detect uh, uh, HABs and the idea of forecasting. So in the next couple of slides here, you'll see some examples of the PowerPoint slides that again are available to you to incorporate into your own presentations. This is one, these are two of the slides from the Red Tide Safety PowerPoint slides. And then this next one here is on the forecasting PowerPoint slides uh, that, uh, that talk about satellite imaging and again, many of the, much of the information that, that Betty already provided to you. The last piece in our, uh, what was created is what we call a kinetic typography video. That's just a fancy phrase for saying that this is one of those um, short videos that has a lot of text on the screen that moves around, has music behind it. Uh, again, these could be incorporated into social media, part of the reason why we wanted to keep them very short, or they could also be included into uh, presentations that you make either by Zoom or in face-to-face -face settings. Again, something to encourage people to get uh, involved with or engaged with the presentation. So uh, rather than to kind of go on describing what this looks like, I'm going to actually have Philip kind of take over and actually show the, the video that was created.
So again, that's uh, information that uh, you can use as that, again, that short video that could be used in presentations or through social media. Uh, so uh, let me make sure. So with that, again, the information, all the materials that you saw uh, are, are ready to be downloaded. Uh, I do want to mention again that the rack cards and issue guides can be ordered uh, using that Qualtrics pay, uh, site that you see there on your screen. Uh, we do encourage though that the issue guides, because they're regular eight and a half by 11, uh, they, that you can actually download those and print those off yourself, especially if you want limited quantities of those. It's really more the, the rack cards that uh, that's very difficult so to print unless you go to a, uh, a professional printer, although you can download them, uh, but there's a, a quantity there that uh, you can order uh, on that uh, Qualtrics site there. So we encourage you to, to make use of those printed materials as well as all the other materials that you saw and that can be downloaded. So with that, um, I think there's time uh, for, for questions. If you have questions about the actual toolkit, that, again, that's the overall pieces that you saw uh, that I presented, or if you have questions for, for Betty, um, I think that uh, we should be ready to go. All right, um, I see one question. Um, I'm, I'm gonna let uh, Betty to, to help with this one. It says the messages and the outreach materials where they have they been vetted by uh, Department of uh, Environmental Protection and DOH to ensure a consistent message. Hi, Rhonda. Um, so not specifically FDEP or FDOH. However, the information was taken um, from mostly the uh, Fish and Wildlife website. Um, we did take, you know, look at some from the FDOH website as well. So we were trying to be consistent with the messaging that that exists, but it had we didn't ask them to go and um, review the content. But we did use their, their content in our, in our messages. I hope that answers. As well as NCAS. I mean, I, I wanna make sure that we, we you know, mention that um, it, it was reviewed by them. Any other questions? Or Betty, if you have anything else that you would like to add, this would be the time to do so. Is the toolkit specific to marine algae, red tide, or are there other resources or also resources for freshwater blooms? Yeah, that's a, a good question, Shannon. Um, so we tried to, where we mention marine algae red tide, it, it will specifically say red tide um, somewhere in there to separate it from the other groups of HABs. Um, so if you see HAB, um, like the, um, the issue guide where we talk about, you know, using satellite imagery, that is um, for HABs in general, whereas a lot of the other materials are more specific to red tide. On the Sea Grant website, however, we do have information on um, other blooms, such as um, sargasm and the cyanobacteria blooms. And I know one of our Sea Grant agents, also where you can find this information, has put up, um, put together a um, some information on protecting your pets during cyanobacteria blooms. So if you go to the Florida Sea Grant website, you should find more than just red tide information. So this is more of a comment. <clears throat> um, this says, this isn't a question, it's a slightly off topic of the toolkit, but your audience might be interested in this red tide study that is seeking volunteers. Uh, and so uh, I can definitely, I will, uh, put that in the chat box there with it uh, for yeah, everyone to see. I can comment on that. So what we're what Nadine's talking about is HABScope, which is that respiratory forecast, I do believe. And um, 
So the, the respiratory forecast um, that I mentioned that's available on the GQ's website, um, that does rely on volunteers to actually go out and collect the water samples at beaches. And so we train the volunteers to collect the sample, to actually take the video under a microscope and upload it to, oh, not, not the neurological study. Ah, okay, okay. So I'm gonna finish with the, the HAB scope though, and then, um, and then we, can, we can do the neurological study. Um, but um, so HAB scope, she says, but yes, on HAB's volunteers. But, um, but HABSCOPE does rely on volunteers and there are some beaches within Southwest Florida, um, in particular in Manatee County um, and some in Lee County at, where we are still actively recruiting volunteers to participate in HABSCOPE. And so now Nadine, the, the neurological study, I'm not super familiar with the neurological study, but I do know that GQs is involved in a neurological study and they're recruiting volunteers. So there is a website that um, she has put in the chat box where they're actively recruiting volunteers. And if you are interested, um, please seek out that, uh, that website. Rhonda, let's see. Rhonda says, I saw in the video, it mentions red tide causes nausea and vomiting. Is this based on aerosolized toxins or ingestion, ingested toxins or both? So that's a good question. And we, we kind of struggled with, um, with where to put different things. When we were talking about um, the HABSCOPE um, respiratory forecasts, we did not include nausea and vomiting because somebody walking along the beach is not going to experience necessarily nausea and vomiting, but, um, but in the video we did because if you were to ingest shellfish or um, during an active red tide bloom, then you could experience um, neurologic shellfish poisoning and that would be one of those symptoms. So that's kind of the, the, the defining line. So we're getting a lot of comments now, uh, which is good, uh, Betty. So I'm going to try to to, to help with, with this, so you're not having to to read and facilitate at the same time. So Great, thank the question you. was uh, the nutrients stimulate the algae, but why don't they also stimulate the seagrass to grow? I don't know if that's okay. the question I wanted to take, but. Uh, um. So nutrients, so nutrients do to some degree stimulate. I mean, seagrass does require nutrients to grow, but seagrasses tend to grow in lower nutrient um, environments and higher light levels, whereas algae can take advantage of higher um, nutrients and lower light levels. So they just kind of have different different requirements, and even within the different, you know, algae is a a huge, um, a huge collection of organisms, and they all have specific requirements. But um, seagrasses absolutely do require nutrients to grow. Right. Uh, there's a comment that says FWRI out of St. Petersburg also conducts field sampling on a mm -hmm. voluntary basis. They provide all sample bottles, reservation, and FedEx shipping costs. So I think that's more of an information piece there. Yeah, so during active Caridia brevis red tide blooms, FWC, um, you know, for their red tide sample um, analysis, they do rely a lot on volunteers. And so I, I think you're right. I think this is saying that, you know, if you're interested in volunteering um, to help uh, FWC, that they um, are almost always looking for volunteers. Okay. A question about uh, is there in, in, any information on HABs related to, to springs? You know, I'm going to say there, I'm sure there is. That is not an area of, um, of expertise that I have. So um, I would not be the appropriate person to ask that question to. That expertise certainly exists within the University of Florida, as well as in some of the um, water management districts and within DEP. Um, but it's, it's just not, you know, I don't really work in freshwater systems, so. 
Maya just uh, put a put a uh, chat a response back in related to the seagrass question. So the person who had the question before me want to look at her chat there too. Uh, so there's a question about this the the composting study it says will you also look at red drift algae? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, right now, I believe the focus is on sargasm, but it was when we. Um, when we discussed this, we did discuss including red drift algae. I don't know if that was included in the grant. Um, there's a, a core group within the, um, the Sea Grant Work Action Group that's working on this. And, um, and I can reach out and find. Was that what, um, Rhonda's question? Yes, yes. Okay. Rhonda, I can, I can find out and, and, and let you know. I, if, um, they received a small grant to do the composting study, and I think the small grant is only focused on sargasm, but I do know the long term um, plan is to look at red drift, but I need to find out more information for you. Great. There's a, a lot of comments mainly directed to us related to uh, information responses, one uh, on uh, a person from the National Weather Service. Uh, saying that learned a, a ton working with Sea Grant and NOS and FWC and INCOS and others to help get the message out about uh, harmful algal blooms to uh, and, and the impacts of on the public respiratory systems uh, and, and related education outreach. So that's that's great. We've gotten several of those already in our chat. So for those of you who are brought out that uh, uh, you know Extension and all the other agencies working on this to, uh, on outreach, thank you all very much for, for those comments. Um, other. I do see this comment from, from Barbara um, regarding Biscayne Bay algae, and um, I'm assuming you're probably talking about macroalgae crowding out the seagrass, and we are certainly having the same um, problems in um, Charlotte Harbor. And um, if that's something that you would like to discuss more, because that's you know kind of the focus on why, why we're putting together this macroalgae workshop, I would um, welcome um, discussing that with you more, um, and maybe we can put my my email address in the chat box um, if anyone wants to reach out, which is stogler at ufl.edu. Okay. Okay. Let's see if we're trying to, to scroll through. Um, other questions, Betty, that you see that, that uh, we can address uh, at this point? So I'm, I'm looking at... Is presence of toxin producing presence addressed at all, or is that too come? Oh, okay. So Shannon is saying that um, with cyanobacteria, the presence of microcystis doesn't necessarily mean that um, it's a toxin producing bloom, and that is absolutely um, true. In the, um, the publications that we produced, we, we really didn't focus a lot on cyanobacteria. It was mostly focused on um, the Gulf of Mexico, and so what? So we didn't um, get into you know toxin-producing uh, microcystis in in these um, publications, but it certainly is in the State of the Science Symposium um, document, and will be in those lay summaries as well. But yes, you're right; it would have been too complex for the toolkit. There were some questions about uh, the, the materials. Uh, again, if you would like a copy of this presentation, we can definitely get a copy of this actual presentation to you. But please keep in mind that uh, a lot of the content um, that Betty uh, mentioned today 
uh, in her part of the presentation are part or parts of the PowerPoint slides that are available for download for people to integrate into their uh, pr presentation. So uh, I can definitely uh, provide this to, to those who mentioned about uh, you know wanting today's presentation, but then you'll also have the information about the toolkit too. So if you'd like that too, we can, we can do that. Um, I think that's, if I'm not mistaken, that's probably most all of the, the comments that we've had or questions. Uh, there's one here on uh, from uh, says, do you or have you considered looking at uh, HAB toxins in the estuaries or the brackish areas? I have not, um, and I don't know. Um, I think there may be some interest from from Dale Laughing House at looking at toxins in estuaries, um, in, in particular as it relates to some of the um, benthic cyano species. But um, that's that's not an area you know that that I'm looking at. Great. 